Yes, Mr. Masiuki. Please start. You have, you have introduced your colleagues. Um, you have one hour. How you divide your, your time is up to you. But we will be very, very strict with the one hour. Thank, thank you, my lord. Yes. Um, my lords and my ladies, the petition before you is challenging presidential elections which were held on 26th of October 2017. And the basis of that petition, my lord, is that it is our view and our submissions that it was held under situations which were in violation of the Constitution on the applicable electoral laws. My lords and my ladies, on 1st of September, you ordered the first and second respondents to organize and conduct fresh elections with strict conformity to the Constitution of Kenya and the applicable election laws. That was the order of this court. My lords, it's our submission that the procedure of conducting presidential elections is expressly provided for in Article 138 of the Constitution which makes it mandatory for nominations to precede any, pres any presidential elections. Actually, it's so important. The issue of nomination is so important that that article, that is Article 138, gives a situation where we can have a president without the ballot, such that if only one candidate is nominated, duly nominated, that candidate shall be declared the president-elect. My Lord, this court has heard before, and it is the position in law, that elections is a process. It's not a one-day event. It is, it is a process. And in our submissions, it must be triggered by or initiated by way of nominations. My Lord, it has been admitted by the respondents that no nominations were conducted for the, repeat, for the fresh elections held on 26th of October. My Lord, in, uh, and my ladies, in our record, we have annexed, annexed uh, JHM1, which appears at page one, and that is immediately after the affidavit. My lords and my ladies, that annexia is Gazette Notice number 8751 of 5th of September 2017. It is purported to be The notice is supported to be gazetted pursuant to laws which have been cited there. That is a proof that the first and second respondents were aware of the provisions which they were supposed to comply with. Of interest, my lord, is Article 137 cited there, Section 2 of the Elections Act, Section 14, and other 
the sections of the Elections Act. My Lord, the question we want to ask ourselves at this stage: did the first and second respondents comply with the conditions and the laws it is cited in this Gazette notice? And our answer to that is a no. My Lord, uh, I will refer you to section 14C of the Elections Act. That section, my Lord, is a section of the law which initiates presidential elections. Its marginal note is initiation of presidential elections. And my Lord, what it is provided is that the notice, which I believe is the one I've referred you to, shall, the, 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 uh, the commission shall publish a notice of the holding of the election in a Kenya Gazette and in electronic and print media of national circulation. And subsection two of that section says, the notice shall be pres in its pres prescribed form and shall specify the nomination day for the presidential election and two, the day the poll is to be taken. Look at this notice, my lords and my ladies. It does not specify the date for nominations. Actually, item B of that notice says there shall be no nominations for candidates participating in the fresh presidential elections. That's a serious deviation from constitutional provision and the Elections Act. Well, would, section 137. Not section that 137, I'm sorry, Article 137 of the Constitution give qualifications for persons who are to be qualified to be nominated as presidential candidates. Well, we have a definition of what presidential election is under Section 2 of the Elections Act. And it says, my, my Lord, presidential elections means an election of a president in accordance with Articles 136, 139, 1B, 146, 2B of the Constitution. My Lord, at that instance, I want to refer you to Article 146 of the, of the Constitution. That 146.1c says the office of the president, president shall become vacant if the holder of the office C says otherwise ceases to hold office under Article 144 or 145, or any, uh, or under any other provision of this constitution. So Article 140 falls within under any other provision of this constitution. So my lords and my ladies, the moment this court annulled Elections of 8th of August 2017, on 1st of September 2017, the office of the president fell vacant. And I, in its directions and orders of that day, the court, this court was alive to the fact that the elections, the fresh elections, 
were to be conducted under the provisions of the laws which are applicable, not at the whims and the desires of the first and second respondents. Hello, this uh, articles of the Constitution written in simple English and do not need special interpretation. My Lord, there are five instances under the Constitution where presidential, fresh presidential elections can be triggered. We have section 139, article 139, sorry, article 140, that is the article which results in what we are doing in this court. Article 145, 144, and 146. Those articles I've mentioned, my lords and my ladies, give timeline of 60 days. All of them, the ones I've enumerated, they give timelines of 60 days. So if a narrative is brought up on the constraints of this section 60, I mean, so, so this, this section on the timelines of 60 days, we must pose a hypothetical uh, question. We are aware that the excuse or reason given for how these elections were conducted is time's constraints. My Lord, if, God forbid, the office of the of president becomes vacant under Article 146, either in, or other articles, for example, in, due to incapacitation or death. Does the first and second respondent tell us that because the timeline is given those articles, we don't have time for nomination? They will pick for us or for this country candidates who actually participated in another elections? No, my lord. And it is our submission that 60 days is enough for nominations. and other processes. Section 14, subsection 2 of the Elections Act. My Lord, only requires, that is the subsection 2, paragraph B, it requires the first and second respondent to specify the day or days on which the poll shall be taken for the presidential election, which shall not be less than 21 days after the day specified for nomination. Simple arithmetic, my Lord, says that from the date of nomination to the date of the poll, the minimum required days is 21 days. And what we are saying, my Lord, is that um, after you issued your orders on 1st of September 2017, the first and second responded would have done a very simple thing. Put up a gazette notice on the same day, 
Specify the day for nominations. Make sure that the date of nomination is 21, at least 21 days before the date of the poll. In the sense, my Lord, the first and second respondents, in our view, went into a fishing expedition of other provisions and other authorities outside the constitution and election laws. The only election, fresh elections, my lord, which can proceed under the constitution without nominations is under Article 138. Five. That article actually goes on to identify and in quotes nominate the candidates who shall be in the fresh elections and even lowers the period to 30 days. And it also lowers the, the threshold of the winning candidate. We cannot call on a rocket. It's not a rocket science, my lord, to interpret what fresh means. That issue was brought up before Honorable Justice Mativo in petition number 471, filed by the first interested party, I believe, second interested party. And he made it very clear that fresh meant anew. There is no special definition. So our position is you cannot start and have a presidential election or any other election for that matter without nomination. It's an issue of comparison, my lord. And the first and second respondent can confirm because it is public knowledge. When an, an election of a governor, a senator, an MP, MCA, and the rest is nullified, do they retain the candidates who were in the previous elections? They go for fresh nominations. So why are we lowering the bar when we come to a serious seat and position, like a presidential seat? Actually, the symbol of national unity. My lords, when elections are null under Act 140, none of the previous candidates, none of the previous processes is saved. All processes are done away with, and actually in your order you said that election was null and void. So it, it's like it did not exist. We all know the meaning of that, that word. Even looking at um, the certificate of nomination. Sorry for interruption, Council. Sorry, my Lord. <coughs> when you are making a proposition and you have an authority for that proposition, please cite that authority at that point so that we don't have to be rewrite again. Like the position you have said that um none of the, the the what of the processes survives if you have an authority please cite it at that point uh my lord so, so, so that as you move if you have any authorities as you move when you are making a proposition cite it there my lord i'll i'll, I'll, I'll refer you to to page 69 of the record
sorry, my Lord, point 26 of the record of the, the supporting affidavit. The numbering of the, 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 the record is different. The petition and the affidavit is numbered A, A1 to, to A19, 119. So I would refer you to page 26. Of the supporting of, of the annexes, my lord, we have proceedings. Actually, it starts from page nine. Proceedings and judgment in petition number five fourteen of twenty seventeen. My Lord, at page 17, there was a reference to you, this court's advice or opinion number two of 2012. Again, in our list of authorities, which we found on 13th of October, there is authority of That is at page 233. Hafford versus Lindsay. It's a Queen's Bench decision at page 858. My Lord, in that authority, it says the nomination, and we evaluated that part is an essential part of elections. Without nominations, no elections ensues. And while on that point, my Lord, on the proceedings I've referred you to, actually, it is that I responded in these proceedings who, my Lord, and I believe they have not changed their position, stated, my Lord, and I quote at page 17, because they were relying on uh, advisory opinion number two of 2012. It says at line eight, all critical steps of the electoral plus, uh, sorry, page 16, Line 10, my learned senior, Mr. Ngatia, said nomination is a critical stage in the conduct of election. It's so critical that in Article 1, that 81, the one I've just referred you to of the Constitution, candidates if one candidate is nominated, the candidate is declared an opposed. And that, I believe, still remains the position in advisory opinion number two of 2012. Yes, it was a submission, but the, the judge agreed with you. And that's why I said I believe they have not changed their position. Um, your Lordship, my ladies. Those, the, after the Gazette notice of 5th of September 2017, they are followed two others by the first and second respondent. In those two uh, Gazette notices, one appears at page. There is one at page 5 of the affidavit dated 13th of October, 2017, and the other one at page three of 29th September, 2017. What they did in those two Gazette notices, my Lord, I believe you'll look at it for, for purposes of saving time. They ended 
candidate on the 10th, five candidates actually, on the 13th of October 2017. And those gazette notices, they specified that, that one of the candidates who was the previous election, that is Cyrus Jirong, was not qualified to be nominated. Then the question would be, between 5th of September and 13th of October, what processes were being carried out to ascertain who qualifies and who doesn't? In Gazette Notice of 5th of September, the campaign period was supposed to end on 16th, sorry, 15th of October. In Gazette Notice of 29th, it was extended to 24th. giving the two candidates who were appearing at that time in the Gazette notice 48 days. Come that in, the 500 candidates had that in 11 days of campaign. Then on 24th, before I go to the 24th, my lord, this one of the team stated that Cyrus Jirongo was not qualified. He was not, not qualified to run and will not appear in a ballot paper. <coughs> it's in the public domain that the first bunch of ballot papers arrived in this country on 21st of October. As at that time, the public and the electorate had been told Cyrus Jirongo was not in the ballot. Then on 24th, my lords and my ladies, a gazette notice is issued. Putting back Cyrus Jirongo in the ballot. As at that time, the campaign period had expired. What is addressing this other, the, the later notice, my lord, is that the ballot were already in this country and the name of Cyrus Jirongo was in the ballot. This, in our view, did not only <coughs> disadvantage that particular candidate, but also those who would have intended to vote for him. My Lord, these breaches of the law and the constitutional provisions had impact on the results <coughs> of these elections. But not, no, any elections conducted outside the realm of the Constitution and the applicable electoral laws, whether or not it, 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 it involved one or two, two or three candidates, should not be allowed to stand. It is important that we guard the spirit of this constitution and the electoral laws we have at present.
we will be asking this court to find that those breaches went into the core of the elections. We, we, we must have a situation, my Lord, where we have predictable processes such that a surgery down the line, our generations will look back and see we have farm laws. It doesn't matter, my Lord, who is dealing with a certain institution. My Lord, I have 29 minutes. I want my learned friend, Mr. Omar, to take the remaining part of our submissions. If it may please your, if it may please your lordships, your ladyships, my name is Omar. I appear for the petitioner together with Mr. Msioki. Your lordship and your ladyships, the case before you is a very simple, a very straightforward case. It is a case about ballot access. It is a case about the conduct of elections. I wish to start these proceedings by underscoring the importance of nominations to the electoral process. Your Lordship and your ladyships, as a matter of fact, nomination is at the epicenter of an election. And that is why, to avoid any controversy as to the issue of nomination, Article 138, in very clear and expressed terms, set out three circumstances under which nominations occur. Your Lordship, on the date set for nomination, if no candidate is nominated, Article 138 is imperative that the election must be cancelled and a new presidential election held within 60 days. And we will see the importance of that in a few minutes. Under Article 138.1, if only one candidate is nominated, that candidate is entitled to be declared elected as president. Your Lordship and your ladyships, if two or more persons are nominated, then you have a contest between two people. And it is only then that Article 138.2 says you go to meet the people at the ballot. I can read for emphasis Article 138. <coughs> two, if two or more candidates for presidents are nominated, an election shall be held in each constituency. I would want to stop at that point and we look at the language that is used under Article 138.1 and Article 138.2. It is not in doubt that the election held on the 26th of October was a presidential election. In that election, if only one candidate for president is nominated, not was nominated, but is nominated, then the election, then the candidate shall be declared elected. The word used is in the current present tense and it ensures compliance. The Lordship Tied to two or more candidates proceeding to the ballot is Article 138.3 that says that the poll shall be taken by secret ballot on the day specified in Article 101 in the places and in the manner prescribed by an Act of Parliament. Your Lordship, the regulations that are made under the authority of the Elections Act provide in express terms that every ballot paper shall contain the name of validly nominated candidates. In this case, Your Lordship, it is not in dispute that no candidate was nominated for this election. 
there was no contest because no two or more persons were nominated because an election only proceeds to the polls when two or more persons are nominated. So there was no contest. And article, under Article 138, 8A, that election ought to have been cancelled 21 days to the election in compliance with Section 14. I wish to take you to Article 1387. Before you go to Article 138.8, you have to pass through Article 137, I mean. In that article, a person qualifies for nomination. It is requirements for a person to qualify for nomination before you go to the procedure at the presidential election where you are nominated. For the avoidance of doubt, Section 2 of the Elections Act defined nomination as delivery of papers to the IEBC in compliance with the Constitution and the Act. Therefore, a look at Article 137, there is a personal duty on every prospective candidate to ensure that he is qualified for nomination. Before he goes to nomination, it is his personal duty to ensure that he is qualified for nomination. And under Article 88.4, K, it is the constitutional mandate of the IEBC to ensure and monitor compliance with laws on nomination. It is a constitutional duty, it is an imperative duty, and this court has stated in the case of Speaker of National Assembly, which is on paragraph 31, paragraph page 51 of our list of authorities, that constitutional procedures are imperative. They cannot be waived, they cannot be ignored, and they cannot be disregarded. Your ladyships and your lordships, it is not in doubt that the, the third respondent is aware of all these articles. And that is why, if you look at page 208, or a list of, of annexures. At paragraph 11. At paragraph 9. Senior counsel Mr. Ngatia accepted that nomination is an essential part of the election itself, which affects the outcome of the election. That was an admission given in open court, publicly, and voluntarily. It was not coerced, and it was an admission in court. Your Lordship, we would have expected, as candidates, as a candidate in the election, that having known that an essential constitutional requirement was being violated, he ought to have taken a personal duty to defend the Constitution under Article 3.2, to ensure that non-elections proceeded on that day. On the very basis, Your Lordship, that while knowing that nominations and qualifications for nominations were imperative, and while admitting openly in court that they were imperative, he goes ahead and then participate in the said elections, he would be required to take an oath under the third schedule, which oath would require him to swear an affirmation that he will obey, he will protect, you will defend and you will preserve the constitution and the law as established. Your Lordship, I wish to take you to some facts that are not in dispute. The first fact that is not in dispute is that no candidate was nominated for the election of the 26th of October 2017. Under Article 138.2, we've seen that if there are no candidate who is nominated, an election cannot be held. What was held on the 26th of October 2017 was not an election within the confines of the Constitution. We have looked at the annexures of the third respondent, and they have annexed the certificate of nomination for the 8th of August 2017. The nomination for the 8th of August is not in doubt, 
expired upon the close of polls on the same day. Can you please give me an authority for that? An authority for? For the fact that that nomination expired. Because that is the issue uh, well, yes. that, that yes. you, you are bringing out. Yes, that is the issue you are bringing out, Your Lordship. Uh, I don't have an authority at hand, but the authorities we have say that before you can move to the electoral contest at the voting, people must be nominated. And it is an express requirement of Article 138. That's all fine. Yes. Article 138 talk, I mean, starts with the general election. Your yeah? Lordship, it is a presidential election. Yeah, it is not a general election. Okay. Yes. It yes. is a presidential election. The words are very clear. Yes. At a presidential election, someone qualifies to be nominated as a candidate after having met the qualifications under Article 137. Mr. Uma, yes. the issue here is, is, is this. Yes. The candidates who participated on the, 20, on the election 26 yes. were nominated for election of 8. 8, yes. You are saying as far as you are concerned that yes. nomination expired. Yes. So what I want is an authority for the fact that that nomination expired and that they needed to go under a further or a, a fresh nomination. Or a fresh nomination. And then we move on. Your Lordship, then first I would uh, direct you to Regulation 16. That is the process where people apply for nomination. And it says specifically you apply for nomination at that election, not any other election, at that <laughs> election, Regulation 16. But Your Lordship, let me just stress, stretch your question a little bit. The third respondent was nominated for the elections of 2013. Did he use the same certificate for the general elections on the 8th of August? Because it was spent. I can read it out, Regulation 16. Yeah. A political party candidate at a presidential election shall be nominated by a political party by an, and deliver it to the commission on the day fixed for nomination of candidates at that election. At that election. It is not at any other election. It's very specific. But your lordship, give further assistance to the court. Form 20 of the regulations that provide for the certificate specifies that you must state the date on which the election is to be held. That is also provided for in Regulation 51 for the, the certificate. And therefore, it is our contention that the election held on the 26th of October 2017 was a fresh election. It was not a continuation or uh, a further election pursuant to the elections held on 8th of August. It was a fresh election. And those are the clear words of the Constitution. Your Lordship, it is also a fact and this cannot be disputed, that all the respondents are aware that nomination was a critical area of the presidential election. And that is the effect of the page I've shown you, because the first and second respondent admitted at length that the nomination was so central to the election process that it would, that would affect the outcome of that election. Having known that, your Lordship, and having admitted that openly, it was improper for them it was deliberate, and so, it so, was... So, sorry, Mr. Omar. Yes. You keep happening on submissions by counsel in proceedings before the High Court. Yes. What is the evidential value in these proceedings of submissions by counsel in prior proceedings in a different court where a different decision, in fact, was given by that court? 
Yes. What is the evidential value of those submissions for these proceedings? Hello, Chief. This petition, when the petitioner became aware of the illegal activities, they moved the High Court on the same petition. And the matters were similar, the matters were the same, and in fact the same petition is annexed to this pleading. Those were, it is the third respondent who are telling us nomination is, is critical, but this is the wrong forum. Now we've brought them to the right forum, where they wanted us to come. And therefore, that is why Mr. Musioki was saying that we still hope their position is the same. Because this is something that is given in public, forms part of the public record, and is an admission. Your Lordship, if you were to look at the decision, it was so controlling to the judge's decision that the judge had to down his tool and say that nomination must only be had by the Supreme Court. Yes, that is the importance of that authority. My Lord, my understanding of the law is counsel cannot make an admission on law. He can only make an admission on facts. So even if my learned friend did make an admission on the law, that is not binding on the court, and the court is still entitled to ascertain what the law is in the particular circumstances. Of That's this. exactly just Srinara's question. Yes. He, I mean, counsel could be making an, admi yeah, yeah. an erroneous yeah. admission for that matter. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it might be an erroneous admission, but when counsel is appearing to court, he's representing the position of his client. When I'm speaking here, I'm an agent of the petition. I'm not speaking on my own. And when I'm acknowledging that this is a critical process that can determine the election itself, then I'm representing the position of the petitioner. The petitioner cannot say to not know what I'm saying in court because he is affected by any decision that I say in court. Mr. Omar, if you remain faithful to your petition, yes. just keep watching the clock. Yes. Time will run out before you finish your <laughs> Yes, yes, I, uh, I have noted that. Uh, Your Lordship, I would wish to reiterate the importance of nomination by citing authorities that have been decided both in Kenya and elsewhere. And the first authority was the case of Karanja Kabage versus Joseph Kiuna that you cited in your decision of uh, the 1st of September. And you stated, and that court stated, that there are certain conditional presidents there are certain constitutional necessities that are precedent to the conduct of an election. And it gave an example of nomination as one of those conditional presidents. That authority has been accepted with approbation by this court and is at page 37 of our list of authority, the specific admissions. But your Lordship, it is also clear that the presidential election is a constitutional issue. And therefore, any breach of that process of the presidential election is a violation of the Constitution. We all know and we all accept that the Constitution is supreme. Nothing, no act, no action can be done that is contrary to the Constitution and that it stands. This has been confirmed by yourselves in the decision of the Speaker of, an, uh, Speaker of the Senate and another versus the AG at paragraph 51 and 52, and I hope that you will find it of great assistance to you. Similarly, your lordships and your ladyships, we've annexed the decision of Dr. Kano Kiza Besigye, where the court stated that where there is a substantial departure from the constitutional imperatives for, for an election, that is not an election, it's a sham election, and the court is entitled to cancel such an election. And to that end, I would want to refer to the decision of uh, Justice J.B. Ojuang in his dissenting opinion, and he says that the Supreme Court is the apex court with the authority to assert the supremacy of the Constitution. So that when we come before the court and we say that the Constitution has been violated, this is the final court with that authority. And I would agree with Justice Ojuang, where he said that we have to draw a correctness or propriety line. What is wrong, we say this is wrong, and the court must uphold it. Lordship, 
the decision for Adford versus Linsky has been mentioned to you, and it was actually produced by learned senior counsel, Mr. Ngatia, <laughs> we illustrate the essential nature of the election. And then he said in his own words that nomination is an essential part of the election. Knowing that it was an essential part, they cannot run away from it. That decision, especially at page 233, is also placed on record for your benefit. Lastly, Your Lordship, if you look at the record, there is when the first and second respondents were conducting nominations on the 28th and the 29th of May for the elections for 8th of August, one candidate presented papers that had not been stamped by the Commissioner of University Education. He was turned away and told that he could not participate in the presidential election. That seriousness, that importance, shows that nomination is at the fulcrum of the electoral process. And to support that decision, we've annexed the, the decision of Ratan and Mol Singh and another versus Atmaram, which is a Supreme Court decision of the Supreme Court of India at page 165, where some candidates had people subscribe to the nomination papers who are not supposed to subscribe, and they subscribe in the wrong manner. The Supreme Court upheld their rejection to participate in the, in the election, and therefore it is a fact that the first and second respondents are aware of the importance. Your Lordship, I would wish to re-emphasize that even if you were to go to the issue of the will of the people, as illustrated and as defined by Justice Lady, Lady Justice Njokindungu in her dissenting opinion, that when you look at a nomination, you should look at it from a right-centric focus. The same return would come for the following reason. By closing out nominations, they violated a critical part of Article 38.3 that requires that any person be able to participate, for, to participate in electoral contest for elective positions. In this case, by limiting this to two candidates when the elections had been invalidated, the first and second respondents also breached the right of all the other candidates who might have wanted to contest for this office. And some of them have even come to this court claiming that they were denied that opportunity to contest. Father, your lordship, the ballot paper must contain only the names of validly nominated candidates. The Constitution under Article 1 says that the sovereign power and the sovereign will belongs to the people. And the people have donated that sovereign power to the state organs so that when they exercise that power, they exercise it in strict conformity to the Constitution. The Constitution requires that only nominated candidates go to the election, and the regulations provide that only validly nominated persons be included in the ballot. By including the names of persons who are not validly nominated on the ballot, the will of the people has been violated. The Lordship, we need not to put further emphasis on the supremacy of the Constitution. It is the supreme law, and it declares so in its founding articles. The question then would come, do we shut our eyes to these violations? Do we move on? and leave these constitutional violations in place? Do we turn our eyes and turn our backs, close our eyes and say we need to move on? Your Lordship, as I conclude, I would state that the Constitution offers the basic architecture of how we organize our affairs, of how we conduct our affairs as a nation. It is supreme and it must be protected. The moment one article of the Constitution is violated, in the name of necessity, or convenience, or expediency, then we are going down a slippery slope, where 
People will author necessities. People will create necessities and seem to justify them through the Constitution. It might have a beginning to allow it to end today, but you might not know its end. It is a critical decision. It's a very simple issue, but it is a very critical decision. I would not wish to be in an enviable position you are in, but the Constitution must be obeyed. It is our supreme law and it governs us all. If we don't have it, then your lordship, you will not, in your address to the country, that you stated that the greatness of our country is determined by the fidelity to the constitution and to the rule of law. We will be moving away from that position. We will be falling away by the wayside. The decision is clear, the authorities are there, the facts are admitted, there is no dispute that there was no nomination, and your lordship, we ask and we invite you to grant the prayers as sought in the petition. Thank you very much.